Sophia Marquis, and I'm a part of the event staff here at Politics and Prose, where we now host in-person and virtual events, along with partnered and supported events, trips, and classes. For a full list of everything confirmed, please go to our website, politics-prose.com. Before we get started today, I'd like to ask you to please silence your cell phones so as not to disrupt the event. While we've looked at the mask mandate here in the store, you are encouraged to wear a mask throughout the event, and we can provide one for you if you did not bring one. When we get to the time to opening the floor to your questions, we've placed, we've placed a standing microphone at the end of the aisle to your right, right there. Please line up at this mic so everyone can hear your question as we want that question to be heard in our recording of the event. We are both audio and video recording as well as live streaming today's program so that you or anyone you know can soon find it at the Politics and Prose YouTube channel. Following the Q&A, we'll have a signing here up at this table. So if you've not already purchased the book, we have many copies behind our registers at the front of the store. Many of, sorry. <laughs> and um, we'll have you line up starting at the microphone and we will come by and ask your name for personalization. So please have your books ready for us. Once the event is complete, we ask that you fold up your chairs and lean them against something sturdy to help us out a bit. So now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming to Politics and Prose, Dr. Norman Rosenthal, celebrating the release of Defeating Sad, Seasonal Affective Disorder, a guide to health and happiness through all seasons, in conversation with Dr. William Stixrud. I'm Bill Stixford, and I'm a neuropsychologist in Silver Spring, and I've been here a long time. And 15 years ago, I got a call from a man who identified himself as Norman Rosenthal. And he said, I've heard about you and your group for years. I'd love to have lunch. And then he started to tell me who he is. And I, I, I interrupted. I said, Norman. He said, I just finished your book, The Emotional Revolution, which is a wonderful book about the, the new science of, of emotion. And I said, everybody in my field knows about you and seasonal affective disorder and your pioneering work in light therapy. I said, I'd love to have lunch with you. And really, I was pretty excited. It felt like I was meeting a celebrity. And speaking of celebrities, the next time I saw Norman, we were being led into a green room with Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr. <laughs> yeah, it turned out that sometime after we had lunch, um, one of Norman's patients said, Norman, the, the, the Transcendental Meditation, TM, helps, has helped me more than anything. You need to do it. So, I, and I practiced TM for, for, for 23 years. So the, he were both, we were there to present at a press conference the day before a, a reunion concert of Paul and Ringo, who were there, for, they were raising money, this benefit concert for uh, a, a foundation that teaches Transcendental Meditation to underserved populations. And so we were in the same room. I, I stood next to Ringo for half an hour, and uh, it's it pretty cool. So, uh, and since then, you know, we, we've uh, Norman's just a, a cherished friend, and just uh, a very valued colleague. And it's been, it's been 40 years since Norman first published the, the work on seasonality and, and the connection between season and mood, um, and it's, seasonal affective disorder is now so well known that it was. It was a question, is the answer to the question on Jeopardy recently. <laughs> Can you imagine? Um, and you know, over the course of his, his career, he, he's, he's done uh, research in not only mood and, and, and seasonality, but, but jet lag. He's done some really interesting work on, on the beneficial effects of St. John's Ward, even Botox for, for depression. Um, and he's a very, just a very interesting uh, mind. And He's also a prolific writer. I think at least seven books have been published in 12 languages, including his classic, The Winter Blues. And I think what is, is the best book ever written about transcendental meditation is book, New York Times bestseller, Transcendence. Um, and he's written other books, most recently, The Gifted of Adversity and Poetry Rx. And he's a beautiful writer. And he's contributed so much and for such a long time but many people think, uh, just assume that he's retired from clinical practice. And it ain't true. Uh, he, he's, he has a very active clinical practice where he's still helping people using a variety of modalities with, with anxiety and depression and relationship problems. And also, he has a, he's a very active coaching practice where he's coaching people who 
need encouragement and coaching on fulfilling a dream like writing a book or pursuing some kind of creative project, and also just helping people who want to be their best selves. Uh, and so um, his work as a scientist and a clinician and a writer has been life-changing for people all over the world. And uh, he's also, I've got to say, he's incredibly wise and warm and wonderful and good-humored human being. And I just, I value him hugely as a friend and a colleague. And um, I'll let him tell you about this wonderful new book, uh, the, 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 the Defeating Sad, which when I read it, it felt like I was sitting in, in the room with the world's expert on a very important topic, giving me advice that was tailored to me. I give you Norman Rosenthal. Thank you. Thank you for that very kind introduction. And also the words a treasured friend actually describe the way I feel towards you and Star. So um, I have a lot of people actually to thank. Um, firstly, Politics and Prose for hosting this. Uh, I think that independent bookstores of this caliber are so rare these days and they, I mean, the word treasure just keeps coming through my mind because um, there have always been these sort of hallowed places which would be quiet and full of the latest, best um, books that you just wanted to buy as many as you could afford and walk out with them weighed down. And that's what politics and prose is like. So. I encourage everybody, you know, once we're done, to just sort of look around and see if there may be something you might want to pick up and uh, enjoy uh, without having to wait for the package to land up on your front porch. Um, Defeating Sad is really the product of 40 years of work, um, starting in the early 1980s when we first described seasonal affective disorder. Um, and of course, when you have that much work, it's not the work of one person. It's the work of many people. So I want to just pay brief tribute to my colleagues at the National Institute of Mental Health, the closest of whom was Tom Ware, with whom I worked for many years. One of my colleagues, uh, Susanna Feldman Naim, is here in the audience. It was such a joy to see her. Uh, the patients, the study participants, you know, they, they really are the subject matter of the, uh, and if it hadn't been for people who recognized this problem and came to us with their stories, we wouldn't know the story. Uh, of course, my family, uh, Leora, thank you for putting up with me, and uh, my son, our son, Josh, and also, uh, I am delighted to have my eight-year-old grandson, Levi. Uh, thank you for coming out on a school night, Levi. Um, it's really appreciated. My story, which was really um, instrumental to my recognizing seasonal affective disorder, is that I come from South Africa, which is a very sunny climate, and came to New York City in the middle of the summer when the days were very long, much longer, of course, than when you live closer to the equator. And I was riding high on these long summer days. And then something funny began to happen. The days very quickly became rather short. And that one day when there was daylight savings time, which I'd never experienced before, all of a sudden, I came out of work, and it was pitch dark outside. And there was like a cold wind blowing off the Hudson River by Columbia there. And I didn't know what hit me. And that happened for three years in a row. Each spring, I would come out. Each winter, I would say, how could I take on so many projects? Last summer, I must have been crazy. And so it went. So when I came to the NIMH, to a group, where they were studying moods and studying light. Um, it was a natural segue for me because, you know, before you undertake a project that's going to take you over several years, you have to have a lot of conviction that there's something valuable about it, that there's something that's going to really give you new information. 
And had it not been for my own experiences and realizing that this was a real entity, um, a lot of people joked with me at first. I remember a colleague at one of the meetings that I attended saying, oh, Norman, you know, come here under the lights because I'm already feeling depressed. And that was a joke <laughs> in those days. But fortunately, it did not turn out to be such a good joke. Um, so over here, um, I have had a lot of different experiences, as Bill has said, and many people in this audience are colleagues of mine, friends of mine, maybe there are even some participants or whatever, and to all of you, I say thank you. Uh, one point I should make, and that is the difference between winter blues and SAD, seasonal affective disorder. Uh, it's really a matter of degree. Some people really are affected by the winter. They are so slowed down, their thinking doesn't work right, they overeat and oversleep, and um, can be really quite depressed. It can be quite serious. That is about 5% of the northern United States population. And then, for every one of those, there are three, say three, 15%, who are just slowed down and they're not their usual selves. And you know, when journalists call me and say, what's the difference? I say, you know, when you write an article, you want it to sparkle. You want it to be full of creative uh, phrases and interesting words. And when you have the winter blues, it's hard just to get the thing out in the right number of words. And you're not that fussy about the words because it's really uh, difficult to get anything creative done. So they definitely need the same kind of help that goes to those with more serious problems. Um, let's talk a little bit about the book, um, Defeating SAD. Um, besides describing SAD, helping people recognize if they have it or the winter blues, I also talk about light therapy. Um, and all about how to create an environmental light situation that works for you, um, and um, other environmental um, interventions that people might not even think about. For example, that coat of grime that settled on your window since last winter, maybe you want to take it off and give yourself more light without costing anything, except for a bit of Windex. And um, similarly, uh, you know, heavy, as they call them, window treatments. I've always thought, you know, you have to be a window doctor to give a window <laughs> treatment. But anyway, make, minimize them so that you get the maximum amount of light. Exercise, I've got a chapter on all of these things because I want to sort of let people go straight to what's of interest to them. Exercise, especially outdoors, because you get the light and the exercise. And incidentally, the growing literature of the antidepressant effects of exercise is really astonishing. I've reviewed it recently. And it's not just the aerobic exercise, but it's also strength training. There's something about this strength uh, lifting and isometric exercise that seems to be effective as well. Weight management, of course, especially uh, people who tend to eat more in the winter, they tend to gain weight, so weight management is important. But um, one line of research that I also, and I just got a chapter on each of these, one line of research that's really done wonders is cognitive behavior therapy. And when we polled, when we surveyed the people in the program at the NIMH and said, what has been most valuable to you about the program. I was sure they would say light therapy, but they didn't. They said understanding our illness, understanding its connection to environmental light, the things we can do, the ways we can make it better. That's been most valuable. And uh, cognitive behavior therapy, or CBT, has really been a revolutionary treatment. And its, it's basic principle is quite simple, and they call it uh, as a mnemonic, they have A, B, C. A is an antecedent event. B is the 
belief that it engenders, and C is the consequence of that belief. So let's say um, I want, let's say I were single, and I wanted a date. And I called this person up, and I asked for a date. And the person said, uh-uh, you know, I can't make it. That often happens with our clients, and they may say, well, nobody's ever going to want to go on a date with me. So the antecedent event, I call to ask for a date. The belief is that nobody will ever want to go on a date with me. And the consequence is that I'm depressed and miserable, and I just want to stay at home. So that's the ABC. So if you say, wait a sec, this particular person turned you down, are there other reasons he or she might have given? Well, it may be. Maybe this person's not available. Maybe this person's not well. Maybe this person already has someone in their lives, and so on and so forth. So once you examine your false belief or your distorted belief, and then you can much more easily say, well, yeah, let, let's give it a try. Let's try a couple of other people. That's a very simple thing. But it could be my boss is looking angrily at me. I'm sure he or she thinks that my work is no good. Somebody looked at me funny in the elevator. Maybe I'm not looking good. Maybe I left some spinach on my teeth. I don't know. So it, the mind can play terrible tricks on us, and CBT does a lot to correct those. I talk about the importance of combining different things. One of the quotes, and each, almost every chapter has got an epigraph, which is that little thing that you have at the top of the chapter that sheds some light and has an interesting or amusing or fun aspect to it. So um, my one epigraph is from uh, a poet, uh, poet philosopher called Archilochus an ancient Greek poet, and he said, the fox has many tricks, but the hedgehog has one big trick. So the hedgehog can curl up in a ball, and his prickles are enough, but the fox can be flexible and can run here and there and sniff here and there and figure out many ways to do something. Now, and in the book, I think you really need to be a fox and a hedgehog. The, the big trick is light therapy and knowing that light is crucial. But there's so many little tricks, and it's all these little tricks that I have chapters on in the book. Now, it's a short book. I wanted it to be. Firstly, I, I wanted a beautiful cover. I didn't want winter and snow and blue and grim. I wanted something that was vivid and bright. Um, I remember I have a very dear friend. She's a uh, classical guitarist. And after a meeting, we went to have coffee. And I was moaning and complaining about all the work I had to do on a previous book. And I said, I've got to, I've got to finish all the analyses, and I've got to write it all down, and da, 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 da. And she said, yes, and it has to be beautiful. And I've never forgotten that, you know, that there's something about life that we have to see the beauty of life and we have to make life beautiful. Our lives and other people's lives and the artist should never forget that because otherwise what are you here for? Um, so that's the one thing. And the second thing is I wanted it to be short. Uh, I wanted to say everything that I thought people needed to know in a slim volume. I didn't want them to struggle through tomes because, frankly, very few people are willing to do that these days. And I remember the, the letter that Mark Twain wrote to a friend that said, I'm sorry to write such a long letter, but I didn't have time to write a short one. <laughs> Sometimes it's harder to write short than to write long. So to, to conclude, I just want to read only one epigraph, which is the one right at the front by uh, one of my favorite authors, Albert Camus, who wrote, in the midst of winter, I found there was within me an invincible summer, and that makes me happy, for it says that no matter how hard the world pushes against me, within me there's something stronger, 
something better pushing right back. That's what I want this book to be. I want this book to push right back. And that's why it's defeating sad. It's not dealing with sad or struggling with sad. It's, it's completely defeating it, which I really believe most of us can do. Thank you very much. Now, we were told a complicated sequence of where we should go, where we should sit. But of course, I've forgotten it completely. Can, right here? OK. That, that, that's very easy. Your mic. Your mic, your mic's behind you. This mic. Um, I think now people should just ask questions and we should repeat it so it goes on to the recording. Incidentally, speaking of recording, for people who like to listen to books as, as opposed to reading them, I have recorded this book myself so that when you listen to it, you'll get the feeling that you're right there in my office hearing it straight from the horse's mouth. Uh, my question has to do with astrology and heredity and what, what, how those could affect, affect said. Astrology and heredity, how do they affect sad? Heredity definitely plays a role. In fact, I talk about the causes of sad like a three-legged stool. There's heredity, lack of light, and stress. They are the unholy trio, as it were that contribute to your getting sad. As far as astrology is concerned, I'm afraid I don't know very much about it. So I think I'm not really qualified to make any comments. So and what uh, about heredity? Are there known genes that can contribute? What about heredity? Are there known genes? Um, there have been many candidate genes examined, so-called SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms. In other words, the gene has got a lot of nucleotides, which are just chemicals, you know, tethered together. And based on exactly which that chemical is, will determine how that gene functions. And so we had uh, a very exciting project where we took a gene that was responsible for controlling the receptor on which Prozac works. And this had been found to be heterogeneous, meaning that some people had one version and some people had another version. And people with the one version seemed to be more neurotic than people with the other version. So we thought, aha! What about our SAD patients? Aren't they going to have a different kind of gene variant compared to regular folks? And so we did that study, and sure enough, we found a difference. Nobody could ever replicate it. Maybe the reason was that we took what were supernormals. In other words, they had no seasonality at all. Whereas if you take an ordinary population, There'll, there'll be a reasonable amount of seasonality even in a so-called normal population. So that narrowed the difference, perhaps. Nobody could replicate it. And neither for any subsequent trial of a SNP variant has it been replicated. So we can't say it. But a colleague of mine, Pamela Madden, went to Australia to work with a geneticist, um, Andrew Heath, and using the seasonality survey that we developed, which determines, and this is in the book actually, you can figure out how seasonal you are just by looking at this seasonal pattern assessment questionnaire. Using that questionnaire, they were able to show in the Australian twin registry, they take twins that were identical, non-identical, raised together, separated at birth, and by doing some kind of complex mathematics, Pam Madden and Andrew Heath showed that there is 
heritability, which is not the same as saying you know which gene it is. Uh, and there was a very happy ending to the story in that Pam and Andrew Heath ended up getting married. <laughs> Hopefully live happily ever after. I've lost touch. Mm. Uh, could you explain for a layperson like myself, uh, how does light work in raising mood, and how does it compare to other interventions like medication or other uh, tools in the toolbox? Fabulous questions. How does light work, and how does it compare to other, other uh, interventions? Well, we evolve with light and dark. So what that means is light is going to work in many different ways. And to know exactly which way is hard to say. One way that light works, and probably works too for its antidepressant effects, is via its effect on the body's clock. Now, the central body's clock is in the suprachiasmatic nucleus of the hypothalamus. So it's connected through the retinas to the suprachiasmatic nucleus, and that then influences the timing of biological rhythms and the level of activity. So that was thought to be the only possible way. But then um, they found most recently, within the last few years, uh, that there is a direct connection between the eyes and the uh, and the thalamus, the perihabenular nucleus of the thalamus. So um, we, we have found that there are redundant pathways. To make life more complicated, sunlight, which contains UV light, which none of our treatments have used, sunlight can stimulate uh, the production of um, endorphins, beta endorphins in the skin. So. Light is so important that through the course of evolution, redundant mechanisms have developed. And incidentally, I have a chapter on that, and it's right at the end almost, so that anybody who gets bored by it won't stop reading. <laughs> How does light compare to other treatments? Well, in the whole literature in psychiatry, you very rarely get a comparative study of if two effective treatments against each other, uh, mostly because most of the studies are drug studies. And you never want to do a study that where your drug might turn out to be worse than your competitor's drug. So you'd rather compare it to a placebo, use very many subjects so that tiny differences give you a statistical difference. And then you can get two of them, you get an approval for the drug. So back to light. There's one study, and it's a study of non-seasonal depression. Um, and in that study, light was compared with Prozac and the combination. And light and Prozac were equally good, but the combination was better. So. Um, can you speak to how SAD may have been affected by the following three items? The first is uh, the COVID disease. Second it are the um, measures that were taken, uh, like lockdowns and masks, et cetera, relating to COVID. And third, possible adverse reactions to the vaccines. OK, well, I, I should start by saying there is no actual data that speaks to any of these points. So we're left with speculation. Uh, let's start with the last one first. I have no evidence to suggest that having SAD or treating SAD makes any difference with regard to response to vaccine. So I don't think there's any connection there. Um, as far as sequestering yourself, you could argue two ways. You could say, well, if people stay indoors and don't get out, they don't get enough light, um, they could be worse. But on the other hand, people with SAD often aren't really in the mood to socialize. So to have a, a socially acceptable excuse for staying home in front of a light box could actually make things better. So you could argue it 
both ways, I guess. So I missed the third one. What is? And the third one was the actual uh, COVID disease itself. There's no evidence of any connection between COVID and SAD. Of course, I can imagine if you have COVID and SAD, you would have two reasons to be pretty miserable. <laughs> so, but that's speculative. Hmm? Anelia. Do people who live in the far north adapt genetically? In other words, maybe people who have got genes for seasonality, maybe they move south, or maybe um, uh, they don't go there in the first place. Um, there's evidence to support that from Iceland, where people seem to be less susceptible than their northern at, uh, uh, latitude would suggest. And, and immigrants have gone from Iceland to Canada, retain that protection against seasonality. Uh, on the other hand, in general, when you're dealing like with the United States and the, the population is polymorphic, you know, then they uh, find that the further north you go, the more seasonality you get. So in, in, uh, at the top of uh, at the Canadian border, for example, you've got about a 9% seasonality SAD rate, whereas in Florida, it's just like 1.5. In, in your book, you talk about uh, light therapy being effective for garden variety uh, depression, for perinatal depression, for the elderly like, like me. Um, is it effective for anxiety? Well, I, I'm so glad you raised this because one of the biggest unknown, I mean, one of the biggest well-kept secrets about light therapy is how many different conditions it can help you with that are not seasonal affective disorder. Non-seasonal depression, um, bulimia, uh, other things that I've, I've mentioned in the book that will respond to light, like perinatal depression, which means depression that occurs around the childbirth, or depression in the elderly. These can all be helped, even bipolar depression. However, there is no good evidence that anxiety is benefited. Nobody's ever tried it, to my knowledge, but I, I think the reason they haven't tried it is that it really seems to work on the depression piece, not on the anxiety piece. And Elia again. Well, yeah. The question is, the questioner said that she's read that people in a coma, if they're placed in a, an illuminated room, maybe with windows, will recover quicker than in a non-such room, in a, perhaps without windows or whatever. I don't know that study, uh, but there are studies of post-operative wound healing which, is, which occurs better uh, in uh, rooms with windows than without windows. Now, one possibility, of course, is through the skin. Um, and that could be the beta endorphins, or it could be vitamin D. You never know. Um, but another possibility is that some light goes through the eyelids. So you're going to get light coming in through the retinohypothalamic tract, uh, even with closed eyelids. 
uh, this is <clears throat> a rather personal question, but I think it's more generalized. Uh, my daughter <clears throat> went abroad with a study um, American Field Service, and she went to Finland up in the land of the midnight sun. She was only 16. And she has, she was there being quite depressed, I believe, although she didn't state that she was depressed. She just said there was not much to do, and it was, you know, 24 hours dark for a month, full month and a half, I think. Anyway, she has become a bipolar depressive and um, in her adulthood, and I wonder if that might have had something to do with it. It's a question I've always wondered about. Well, I guess I would like to ask a follow-up question. Uh, this lady, her daughter, who currently has developed bipolar disorder, went to Finland as a young woman and was exposed to 24 hours of darkness. She was depressed at the time when she... No, she didn't say she was depressed. Okay. But I, her letters uh, indicated she didn't have much to do. Right. She was having to babysit, and, and there was only cabbage and potatoes to eat. It was a pretty... Because she was also a vegetarian. You know, one of the problems that we have as psychiatrists or psychologists is being able to n infer cause and effect in retrospect. Yeah. To say that this caused that, um, y you just can't say it. Yes. You know, so you, what you do is you, you rely on your experience and instincts from other situations, which isn't very strong evidence. But my guess would be that Finland didn't have a lot to do with it. No, I don't think that was Finland. I think that um, it was probably going to emerge anyway. Yeah, there, was, there was a genetic. Yeah. Um, over there? You. Do you want to come to the microphone so they can hear your question? Sure. Is there a relationship between vitamin D deficiency as a confounding or biomarker for SAD? That was my first question. And the second one is, does infrared light count for uh, light interventions, like, for example, going to saunas? Two really excellent questions. The one is, what's the role of vitamin D? We have found in, in experimental studies, we looked at vitamin D levels in SAD versus controls, and we looked at the effects of vitamin D. That my colleague Dan Oren did that in our group. And neither did vitamin D administered, vitamin D3, neither did it do any good, nor were there any differences in levels. However, there are so many people who will swear that the vitamin D is helping them. And I can't you know, disavow their comments, but there is no real scientific proof. So. Uh, remind me of your other excellent uh, question. Infrared. Infrared. <clears throat> infrared probably is inert, probably has no effects. In fact, we actually used to draw melatonin samples around the clock from people in infrared lighting conditions because it was equivalent to darkness as far as a lot of the relevant receptors were concerned. So um, I don't think that uh, infrared would be helpful. Incidentally, there's, there's a very, very recent finding about the value of vitamin D in uh, intestinal cancer. And uh, the work is done by a colleague, Michael Hollick, who for years has realized that there was an association between the prevalence of colonic cancer and the amount of sunshine in any given place. And he has been hot on the trail of vitamin D. And this study is there's certain type of tumor when of, the of the intestines, when people were supplemented with vitamin D, they did in a much better way. I just read it. So it definitely is very biologically active. But as far as mood's concerned, uh, there isn't the data. So a friend of mine, not me, 
if they were going to go to Amazon and order a light bar, are they all created equally? And that's one. And two, how quickly do the light bars work? Is it like flipping a switch and you feel better the next day, in a week, or in a month? What kind of light box to get, basically? I've gone into detail here um, so that you can see the various models, the pros, the cons. But in general terms, I think that the surface area has got to be at least one foot square. And it's got to come from a reputable company, and it's got to have a UV screen. Uh, and so most of the well-done um, boxes are like that. Now, um, this is, I, I am fortunate, my son, Dr. Josh Rosenthal over there, uh, he and I are often talking about light boxes. And he says, oh, you know, you're always being fussy about what kind of light box you recommend to people. I just say to my people, you know, get the cheapest light box that you can afford. And it works just as well. So, less, so less than $25. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, we have a lot of fun arguing about such matters. And of course, neither of us has got the actual data. You know, we just got our clinical experience. And uh, my clinical experience and personal experience says, that if you've got a teeny weeny light box, if you move your head around, you're gonna get too little light. So get a box that's decent in size, um, and that will, that will be what you need to do. And um, you know, you'll know you see a variety in, in the book. Um, the other thing is how long does it take? It varies. It varies from person to person. But we did do one study that shows that one hour of light therapy predicts who will be responding after one week. So there is an immediate effect that is predictive. And I can tell you just personally, I sit in front of my box at this time of year, 15 to 20 minutes, and I can already feel I'm ready to go up and I won't say conquer the world, but at least face the world. How about that? Mm -hmm. Eric. Well, I think, yeah, does where you grew up influence whether you're going to get sad or not? I don't think it influences whether you're going to get it. But I was 20, 25, 26 when I came from South Africa. Had I grown up, say, in New York City, I may have gotten it 10 years earlier just because I would have been exposed to those short days, which I wasn't. So I think that that there's an environmental impact of having grown up in a sunny place that delayed the onset of what. It also, if I'd grown up with it, I probably wouldn't have recognized it because it was only the sharp contrast that helped me recognize it. Definitely, and they think it's the beta endorphins because when they've tried to block that with naloxone, uh, they send these people into withdrawal. So there's evidence that the endorphins are being activated through the skin by UVA and B, and that if you block that, it's a Harvard study, they will go into withdrawal.
Yes, 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 quite right. Um, what you said about the retina and the hypothalamus or whatever is interesting to me because my mother had macular degeneration. And as she got older, she became so light sensitive and so readily depressed um, when the days would change um, and even just the weather. And so I'm wondering, wonder what, uh, since I too have macular degeneration now and I can, I'm, I'm being told that's why I'm very, uh, I'm not getting enough light uh, to see. I have light gathering issues. So I'm wondering. Is there anything that you can do for that besides be out in the light? Or do you think it's probably one of those things where my mother should have had medication because it would have helped her dealing with that? Okay, it, it, question. Um, what is the relationship between macular degeneration, light therapy, how do you treat your, your depression if you've got macular degeneration? Unfortunately, almost any ophthalmologist would say don't use bright light because it speeds up macular degeneration and retinitis pigmentosa. So that's one real contraindication. But if you look in my book, there are many things other than light therapy that you can do for depression, including medications. I've got this long list of medications right stuck at the back so that I'm not going to cause anybody to stop reading. But, <laughs> but um, medications can help. Therapy can help, exercise can help, many things can help. Dr. Josh Rosenthal? Dr. Rosenthal, could you mention something about the Dawn Simulator? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, the Dawn Simulator is a, a wonderful device. I know that we, our children, I was talking about it to a client earlier today about um, how do you gradually get light up in the winter when the sun is rising very late how do you get the light to come up gradually? Um, and there are special devices called dawn simulators. And uh, they will slowly increase the light in a way that is easy and helps people wake up and doesn't feel jarring and sudden. Would you say that covers it more or less? Yes, and also it has shown therapeutic efficacy. Shown therapeutic efficacy comparable to some light therapy studies. Uh, Bill, I don't know if you've got any other questions for me or... Dr. Rosenthal, just really quick. I, just, I, I mentioned that also in the context of uh, a level of light that would probably be uh, safe in macular degeneration. Oh, that's really a clever point. The amount of light that you're getting through the dawn simulator is so much less because the eyes are so sensitive that early in the morning that what Dr. Josh Rosenthal is suggesting that is that that might be a way of getting light safely, but you'd have to check because if the eye is more sensitive to the mood light effects of light, maybe it's also more sensitive to the macular effects of light. So check with your, uh, with your doctor. But the other thing about the dawn simulation is that light is not direct. It just kind of gives the ambient light levels a boost, and that might be really very helpful. Thank you. Could you tell us about negative ions? Oh, I have a chapter on negative ions. And uh, I'm going to read first the epigraph, which is from Raymond Chandler, to that chapter. OK. Raymond Chandler wrote, there was a desert wind blowing that night. It was one of those hot, dry Santa Anas that come down through the mountain passes and curl your hair and make your nerves jump and your skin itch. On nights like that, every booze party ends in a fight. <laughs> Meek little wives feel the edge of the carving knife and study their husbands' necks. <laughs> So what goes on with the Santa Ana winds is that they're full of positive ions. These are charged particles in the air that you get through these hot, dry winds. On the other hand, when you're by a waterfall or by the surf and the water's sort of turbulent, you get negative ions. And those have a very good effect on mood in general. You know, you feel so good when you're by the surf or by a waterfall. 
Um, of course, you're probably staying in a great hotel, and you're <laughs> probably having a lot of other good things happening. So, so it's not exactly the best controlled study. However, they've done controlled studies of negative ions in SAD, and there are some absolute positive studies. And I've even got the picture of the ion generator, and um, if you get a, the, and it's from the Center for Environmental Therapeutics, and if you contact. Jessica Rao, and tell her that I told you about it. She'll give you a discount. <laughs> I don't know how we're placed for time, but I don't want to overstay our welcome here. How are we? One or two more questions right here in the front. No. Well, I didn't have a question. I was just noting that there's a clock right there. Oh, thank you. Goodness Norm, me. <laughs> Norm, in, in, your, in your book, you, you say that with this combination of uh, treatments, in, in your experience, you, you can basically get almost all of your SAD patients symptom-free. So tell us about that. Yeah, I would say I think that almost all of my SAD patients, and there are a lot of them, are free of symptoms. Now, does it mean that winter is the same as summer? No. But they can enjoy the winter, and they can be functional, and do what they need to do, and, and have fun and make the most of it. And um, I'm just so happy that they can be so well cared for and feel so good. But you've got to combine all the different things. You can't just rely on one thing, even the light. And Nelly, I think you had one more question. Well, how do, we, how do we compare the human condition of seasonal affective disorder with, say, hibernating bear? Uh, or I don't know if any of you have ever seen, you can look at the YouTube video, uh, where they house cattle like cows in dark stalls through the winter. And then one day in spring, they open up the doors of those stalls and you see these cows dashing out and cavorting in the grass. And they're so happy, they're almost manic, you know. So I think that the seasons have been a powerful influence on evolution. And they have, they have been so important, and particularly on the female, because the female needs to give birth at the time when the young are most likely to survive. And it's not coincidental that women outnumber men in the CSAD by three or four to one, because somehow the fertility cycle has gotten hooked onto the seasonal cycle in such a way as to favor the survival of the species. So um, I think that there are analogies that you can see throughout humans and animals, including seasonality. OK, any, any other questions? That I always remember George Bernard Shaw said at the end of one long meeting, he said, you know, the subject's not exhausted, but the audience is. <laughs> so maybe this is as good a time as any to stop. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much.